We're living in a country where the schools of higher learning are saying slavery is the product of white supremacy. It's the problem of the white man having power over the people of color. And that is not true. While slavery was indeed involved in our country, and there indeed were whites over that, but it's not that our country is, uh, is a country that is uh, infected with racism. If it's based upon slavery, then you've got all the countries in the, in the world, a lot of nations in the time of history have had slavery. Slavery has been a universal problem among all the nations. But it's used today to bring forth political advantage and that sort of thing. And, but one of the things when people want to talk about that, that people of color have, especially the blacks against the whites, which is what our country like to divide it into, is the fact that the black people say, well, I, I, we asked the question, who ended slavery? Did the white man end slavery? Britain, Wilberforce, white man. We fought a civil war to end slavery. That was the white. We don't want to talk about that, but yeah, we want to talk about that. It's the whole picture of truth. And when we speak about the fact of, well, you don't know what it's like to feel that way. You, don't, you just want to talk about what the results were. We need to talk about how bad it was. And you know what? That's fine, too. We open our Bibles to the book of Lamentations. What's that whole book about? How bad it was to be destroyed by the Chaldean army. God does not hide that. In fact, we have a book that just emphasizes it, that we're going to have to be involved and in feeling something we've never felt before probably. We never had a nation go under uh, another nation's power. We never had the war that we're having here where our homeland has the effects of what has happened in Jerusalem. So we feel bad, but we also know truth. And what we shall see in our study in these first two chapters of Lamentations is that God will give you the reason why Jerusalem was destroyed by the Chaldean army. And he's telling us also how it felt in Lamentations. I'm just interested, it, it impresses me when I see how people want to act in their world today and get their points across and the arguments they make. We're feeling both the pain of oppression, and we're also feeling who ended it. Who, what's the result? What do, lesson do we learn from it? Instead of keeping on hammering down, well, you don't understand, and you didn't do this, and your lineage did this, and we're supposed to, we're supposed to be proud of our lineage, or whatever that was. I'm not proud of a lineage that does bad, but that's the way our minds think today, and you may be thinking that. But all I'm saying is that in the book of Lamentations, if you're on the side that the people don't know how I feel, we're going to get a, we get these chapters all about the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar and how the pe people felt and who's writing it. Who's writing it? Jeremiah the prophet who warned them why this was going to happen. And he didn't care about how it felt. It helps us in our society. I care what the pain people go through. I look at the solutions. I see what was the result. Who, who ended it? How did it start? Why did it start? All those things you can learn. Why hide the truth? Well, we divide. God unites us because his book is truth. And I hope that as we go into this journey, we finish the book of Jeremiah. For those of you who are visiting with us, and we've now started, we dealt with the introduction last week. And so we begin with the questions on our a chart that we have here of lamentation. We'll take the first and second chapters. Don't know if we'll finish all those tonight, but those are, that's where our questions come from. How was Jerusalem like a widow? She's alone, isn't she? Uh, so we see, we always get the picture of describing God's people, Jerusalem, as, a, as in a feminine way. She, her. We'll see that throughout the first part of this, of this chapter. 
So he says, now how doth this city sit solitary? I've got the American Standard Version, so your translations may read a little differently. How doth the city sit solitary or alone is the concept that was full of people. Just stop there. What would, I, I know Pasadena is not a big place, but this, this, this just take us out of here. Just take everybody around here. Remember we had a preacher that was working with us and there was that bird, big hurricane came. Well, he stayed. He is from Missouri. He wanted to see what it was like. So he stayed, and all of the streets were bare. Now, he got out and got in trouble. You know, the law said, you need to get back in your apartment. But he got out, and he just was what it was like to, nobody's here. All of us, the brethren that he'd come to know, we weren't here. We're gone. And the solitary, just that moment, quietness. He said, oh, I like a little bit of that. No, you, you, you want this? Nobody's there. It's desolate. It's empty. And you remember, hey, I remember sitting in congregation people on Wednesday night studying our Bible. And we were going to sing and we're, we're praying and we're talking and visiting and all those events. And the outside, all things are happening around us. It's not there. And that's how he opens this. That's not a good feeling. Just like a widow who's now alone because her husband has died. That's not a good feeling. She's become as a widow, but see, she was great among the nations. She that was a princess among the provinces is become what? What does your virgin say? Huh? Oh, slaves. Mm. My Bible says tributary. She's under siege. She's, uh, she's going to have to give... Uh, Obedience to someone, a tributary. It's not the big river, it's a tributary. And it's a slavery concept. She was a princess, she was a queen. Now she's a slave. And this is the consequences of not obeying God, as, as we will see, especially in this first chapter. So I hate that feeling, but uh, especially when I was once busy and, and uh, regarded well among the peoples as a princess and, and all of that. And now it's, it's gone. I've become no better than a bond servant to the people that have captured us. That's how Jeremiah opens uh, the book. So let's put together two, I mean, excuse me, let's put together two passages here and see if you can see a distinction between each two. Of what historic, we've studied Jeremiah, those, those of you who haven't, not, not holding you accountable, that you'll learn something by looking at these two passages. Help me understand, are there two distinct moments? What, what is different between the historical events that we read here in these two passages? So let's look at Lamentations 1 and verse 6. From whom the daughter of Zion... In all her majesty, she's like a princess among all the uh, people around Jerusalem. But, but, she's, what, but she is that majesty is, 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 is departed. Her majesty, glory is departed. Her princes are become like hearts. They, they find no pasture. And they are gone without strength before their pursuer. So I look at that is that there's a departation. They don't find pasture. They don't find a resting place. They don't find a, a hiding place. And uh, hearts is a beautiful picture <laughs> of, of, of deer. And she was a princess, and now she's going to be a bondservant. But like hearts that find no pasture, you can just be a beautiful, eloquent animal. If you don't have pasture, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. And that's what she's like. And they're gone without strength. When I need my strength, need to have some oats, need to have some pasture. When I need to have my strength, I don't have that because I am being pursued. Now you take those things as a mark. What, what events are we talking about there? And if you were just to read that passage without comparing it to the other one, 
What does that look like? Nebuchadnezzar came three, you know, Babylon came three different times to Jerusalem and took people in captivity. But which one is he talking about here, you think? Where they departed the city, trying to find pasture. They did not find that. They're being pursued by the enemy. We just got to reading in the, re in the reign of Zedekiah. How did he, how did he depart the city uh, when, he, when he left? How did, that, how did that happen? What was that like? Yes. Toward Jericho, and they were pursued and they were taken. Zedekiah was was they're out there not finding pasture like heart. You know, they're they're captured. They they left when the walls are being besieged. They found a secret way out. Zedekiah in the men of war, men of war leaving with him, very close to him, and they start running. And I think this passage showed, hey, they didn't make it. They, they were caught. They're not going to escape that. So we look at verse 10. The adversary has spread out his hand upon all her pleasant things. Hmm, pleasant things. Honorable things. For she has seen that the nations are entered where? Her sanctuary. What's the sanctuary among the Jews? The temple, the house, the tabernacle. We see all different type of descriptions of that in, in Lamentations. That, that the nations that entered their sanctuary, concerning whom thou didst command, that they should not enter into that assembly. The tent of meeting, the assembly, tent of meeting. God's presence would be there over the Ark of the Covenant, and sacrifices be offered, is where God met his people in his glory. When did that happen? Not when Zedekiah got taken. The next month, in the fifth month, we finally came and destroyed the temple. So he has both of those events lamenting about them. And here's the holy temple of God. Here's the, the temple that is... Is, uh, shows, is set apart by all other, you know, all other gods. God, that's his place that he's, he has. And it is indeed going to be taken away. And it was destroyed. And when no nations should even come into it. And who was behind that? God. God would never do that. He did. He did. Chaldeans wouldn't have any power to do that if God had not said, you're, you're the one I'm using to do this. Read up, read it, Habakkuk. Habakkuk was astonished. <laughs> Will you bring the Chaldeans on us? I know we sinned, God, and I wish you'd do something about that. And I'm going to. The Chaldeans are going to take it. The Chaldeans? That hasty, mean, cruel nation? Yeah. God would not do those things. You'd be surprised what God will do when he brings judgment upon people that have refused. The prophet Jeremiah refused the prophets. The priests are corrupt. The prophets are false. They don't listen to Jeremiah. They want to kill him. And though God could not destroy people in hell, he said he will. But we don't want to talk about that. And, but we, we do. We want the truth. And who talked about hell more than anybody else? We wear his name. Christian Christ. No one talked about, about more than he did. And he goes to the place for us. He had to die, resurrected, go to have a prayer place for us so we don't go there. And he keeps warning us, you don't want to go there. And I just think, it's, you, see, you see God behind all of this, and that becomes very uh, dealing with how people think about God. He's just kind of a lovable grandfather, and, and uh, he, he's, he's love, that's true. But see, it's just like the other thing about slavery. We just hear one side of it, how we want it to use, be used, and instead of we want the whole truth. God 
is, is, is one that is, is loving, but he also can be very severe. Behold the goodness and the severity of God. How plainer can Paul make it? And we don't accept it. We've got to accept it if we, we accept the truth. So those are, those are the two events. And we, we've studied, we've looked at those in Jeremiah that has that's taken place and that becomes important. All right, what had Jerusalem failed to remember and what did she remember? As we look at this, this first chapter. That's right. Remember the latter end. What's the latter end for those who will not go to heaven? <laughs> he warned them. For us, it's, it won't be Chaldea and dispersion and come back 70 years. It's eternity in hell, fire and brimstone, punishment, eternal punishment. So we just put that out of sight and we do what we want to do. And we make God out of our own image. No, not you and me. We're not doing that. We want to know the truth. So that's verse 9. That's what she, that's what she did, didn't remember. Now, what did she remember? She remembered the pleasant things. When do you remember the pleasant things? Like mom and dad sitting on the porch. When do you remember that one? When they're gone. When you don't have them anymore. When no one's the pleasant things that you had. We could be in the pastures and we could be farmers with sheep. We could be growing wheat grain. We could, I, I, liked, I liked the days of Ruth. You know, I, I remember back in the days of Ruth, how honorable people are in the book of Ruth. Of even one going to take Ruth on as his, his wife. Of the man who owned the property, leaving stuff aside so Ruth can just go and get it and trash it. No, she worked for it. She worked for it. She went and got it. The beautiful honor of principle and all the things that stand out. Oh, I remember those days. That's when the people of God, and you can just remember that all you want to, and you will, when it's no longer there. When it's no longer there. And that can happen to nations, that can happen to countries. You just remember the chaos we're in here, of course, our country is. He said, I remember the day you could leave your doors unlocked. And you'd walk down the street without wondering who, who's going to step out any moment. But we have to be aware of your situation. Beware of your surroundings. Guys will come up and take purses off of, of women. <laughs> so what do we do? We get our guns. Oh, chaos. And we're going to protect ourselves. Because you never know, we can't, well, government, the police may not get here in time. We live in that type of fear and world. And when, when all of that law and order, all those things are taken away, you, you sit about, remember. And then the Ecclesiastes don't remember the old days. <laughs> so you come back to reality and try to find, well, what is nice here? What can we do here? What can we do about it? How am I going to live with those realities in a positive way that, that exalts God? It makes you, makes you have to think. But when things are taken away that were pleasant, they've been, they've been taken away. Jerusalem is destroyed. The holy temple is rooted out like a tent in a garden, just like a little booth. It's been taken out. And now all we have is Chaldeans. And God says, just 70 years, then I'll bring you back. And that's... Uh, that's what they had refused to acknowledge, even at, the, at their late date. All right. What do we say? Why, why are these uh, verses? Why do you just have 22 verses? A lot of these chapters, chapter 1 and chapter 2, for our example. What did we say last time in our, our study and in introduction? What might that mean? That this is an acrostic psalm. This is an acrostic a psalm. Each of the verses begin with the first letter and this is a consecutive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. How Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters. Maybe it was done from memory, but as we talked last week, it could be we're covering the whole gambit of the alphabet to show you the full feeling of my lamentation, where you could remember 
that in order. Because one of the chapters, even though it has 22 verses, is not an acrostic. But we find them divided that way, those that are, are indeed have that, that point there. So we're, what we're seeing something divided, though, in this section of these 22. So what did you, what did you see that's different, <coughs> uh, verses 12 through 22, than 1 through 11? We looked at 1 through 11. What do you see different? Anything? The person changes from third person to first person. Okay. The latter part is I, I, I. It's like there is someone that's talking. The first part is observation. Yeah, her, she, her. Right. Y'all get that? Because there's the, the third person out of the city. Uh, Judas comes and talks about verse 3, her persecutors overtook her, then the straits. Now, verse 13, my bones. And I think that's significant. You can talk about her and she, but then you talk about me. That's when pain hits. That's, you know, my sickness, if I have it, it's the worst thing anybody could ever have. She had this, she had that. That's kind of bad. I understand that. But, oh, y'all look at mine. What is he doing? He's internalizing it, and this Jeremiah's writing it, writes both these sections. But now it's personal. Jerusalem's feeling it. It's not she, it's not her, it's me. And that's a powerful, powerful way of getting across the psalm. And we see it even in our, in our English. We're, we're observing that. So what do we begin to see? In number, question number five, what four metaphors? Metaphors, symbolic language. We're in, we're in a song type of, of poetry. So we've got to be thinking in terms of that. So here's, here's figures of speech. And when, I'm, when we speak about a metaphor, it's not like something, like a simile. It's a, if you, take on, you take on this quality of something I've, I've talked to you about. What four metaphors do you see in verses 12 through 15? Let's begin reading. Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, not her sorrow, my sorrow, which is brought upon me, wherewith Jehovah hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. All right, we're ready. We're ready. What's the first one? From on high hath he set fire into my bones and it prevaileth against them. So what's his anger like? Fire. That'd be a good place to start. It's like fire. I'm sure they saw a lot of fire and take it down the walls, fire burning the city. But there's fire. It's, I feel it in my bones as people are, are destroyed. But it's my bones, and it prevaileth against them. They went out, the fire winds. He has spread a what for my feet? Second metaphor. A net. What does a net do? I didn't say a net. I'm not talking about a girl. I'm talking about a net. What does it do? It captures you, doesn't it? For my feet. For my feet. And we see that, that I've, it's, it's caught me. He has spread a net for my feet, and he has turned me back. He got me, and I'm taken out. I'm going into captivity. I'm going to be tied up with a bunch of other people who have been captured, and we're going to end to their city, and they'll be victorious, and we'll have to go through uh, that pain. Out of Proverbs 13, it's made me desolate and faint all the day as his weakness, but they've ensnared his, his feet. Verse 14, the what is of my transgressions is bound by his hand. What does he say? The yoke. The yoke. Is bound. And it's the yoke of my transgressions. I am burdened because of my what? Transgressions. Now, I want to just pause there. Just see if Jeremiah, what he has done, and bring us attention. Who, what was the cause of all this? We see the pain. 
And we, we answer that about slavery. Slavery, you need to know what pain was like. Well, you didn't go through it, but my ancestor did. Well, what, what was that like? Well, we're seeing what it's like. But what was the cause of that? You know, why don't, you, why don't we see that? Well, when we're looking at God's word, when it comes to what happened to Jerusalem, it's exactly that. Look at, this. just, I, I want to read this real quickly because it's, to me it's, it's, uh, it's important. Verse 5, her adversaries become the head, her enemies prosper. Why? For Jehovah hath afflicted her for why? Why? What's the cause of this? It's so painful. What's the cause? The multitude of her transgressions. Verse 8, Jerusalem hath grievously sinned, therefore she has become as an unclean thing. She's reaping the reproduction, the, the, the product of her uh, uh, not being faithful to God. Like a, like a prostitute or one that's been unfaithful to her husband. Verse 9, her filthiness was in her skirts. She remembered not her latter end. Therefore, she's come, she has come down wonderfully. Doesn't mean, hey, that's great the way you came down. No, it's amazement how horrible you are when you came down. Wonder, could it get that bad? That's the feeling in Lamentations. She hath no comforter. Behold, O Jehovah, my affliction for the enemy hath magnified him, himself. But that has been brought up on them. Then verse 18, as we're, we're going past verse we've been looking at. Verse 18, Je Jehovah is righteous, for I have rebelled against his commandment. I have rebelled against his commandment. Verse 20, Behold, Jehovah, for I am in distress. My heart is troubled. My heart is turned within me, for I, I have grievously rebelled. So we, we, can, we can look how painful, we, we use the example of slavery, and we can go back, what were the causes of this? And it's the idea that it was a lot of money was saying, it was involved with that, that's why they came from, from way over Africa, they were enslaved, but whites have been enslaved. Uh, it's all about having power over another human, and that's horrible to have to go through. And that was, that was ended. But that type of thing, this horribleness came upon God's people. And the reason is, is that they rebelled. It's a, and, and Jeremiah said, we rebelled. I'm, I'm, I'm representing Jerusalem. Poor guy, he didn't, he didn't want to rebel. He didn't, he, 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 he was telling the truth. But he, he feels it, because that's, that's his people. And so we see that those events happening where the, the, the responsibility for the sin has come upon them. And so this yoke of my transgressions is bound by his hand. I can't get rid of that. I've got to face the consequences. They're knit together. They're come up on my neck. He hath made my strength to fail. God did that. Because of what? My transgressions. Responsibility. Not God. Not well, there's something wrong with God if he does that. No, God is just and he's righteous. And we've got to learn what that means. And that's what, what, what we're doing. And so those are the sense. So there's the four metaphors. Fire, net, yoke, and we've got one more. What is it? Verses 12 through 15. I'll read it, verse 15. The Lord has set it not all my mighty men in the midst of me. He hath called a solemn assembly against me to crush my young men. I think that's interesting because of what happens next. The Lord hath trodden as in a winepress the virgin daughter of Judah. Crushed my young men. And what's the fourth metaphor? Winepress. Includes the young virgin. Here's the, the young men, the young women. And they're crushed like a winepress. And God, you've done that through the enemy. And so all of those expressions are just way of looking at it, uh, where you, you grab me by my feet, I can't walk and feed them any longer. Just like people were sold into slavery, a horrible situation those things are. And we can feel, and we, we're bringing ourselves to feel, well, we might not experience that. Lamentations is there for us to feel. And I want to feel that. That's why it's there. 
I know what happened. I know why it happened. I know who God, why, how God brought it about. And I, that's instructive. And so is the feeling of it. Because that is how horrible uh, it, it, it was upon them. All right. Question number six. What is the eye running down with water in Jerusalem's plight? What, what is, why does the eye runneth down? Okay. Uh, verse, verse 16. For these things I weep, mine eye, my, uh, I weep, mine eye, mine eye runneth down with water, because the comforter that shall refresh my soul is far from me. Who might that be? God, who calls I separate myself from him. He's close by. It's your sins that separate you between him and him. And that, that would be the one I could go to for a comforter. Remember, he's that kind of God too. But sin is the consequences. And this is what it feels like. I cannot stop crying because what I had was pleasant. The comforter. And he's so far removed from me. I'm feeling it. But, well, you feel it, therefore you got the truth. No, the truth is, I caused it. Now, the slaves didn't cause that greed of men and all the different things that have happened with men. And they, it's been in, slavery's been in place, but it, it took the Western civilization, the Great Britain, and the United States to bring it to an end. And God will bring this destruction upon the people and he will not completely annihilate them because they'll be coming back to start new in, in 70 years from these, these events. Okay. Question number seven. In God's anger, he become as and what to Jerusalem? We enter in chapter two. He had become as a, as a what? He had become like an enemy. Look at verses four through six with me. He's been his bow like an enemy. Been his bow. You get arrows and a bow and you, you, you warfare. God's doing this. He's using the Chaldean army. He works through instruments of nations. He has stood with his right hand as an adversary. <clears throat> Thank you. He has slain all that were pleasant to the eye. Oh, Israel's the pleasant apple of my eye. But he has slain all that were pleasant to the eye that people could remember those things. In the tent of the daughter of Zion, he hath poured out his wrath like fire. The Lord has become an enemy. He swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all her palaces. He has destroyed his strongholds. He has multiplied in the, in, in the daughter of Judah mourning and lamentation. He has violently taken away his tabernacle as if it were of a garden he had destroyed his place of assembly. He's caused the solemn assembly and Sabbath to be for, forgotten in Zion. He had despised in the indignation of his anger the king and priest. So here is an enemy where indeed he swallowed up, up Israel. King, there is majesty, majestic, ruler. You could be ruling according to the things of God or not. And these last kings have not. And who ought to be the garden of, guardian of, of holiness? The priest. The corrupt too. And we're going to bring in the prophet uh, in our, ne our next question. But there's a sense of, of that enemy. We could, we could say a lot of that. Psalm 80, for example, God's people are like a vine that came out of Egypt and God planted them and he grounded them. And here it's just like rooted out. Here's like a vine, is like the tabernacle. It's just like a vine rooted out of a, as a weed in your garden. You know, that, that was, that was the, 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 the glory of God was found there. When you go to captivity, you pray toward the temple. And it's holy, and, and that's the tent of meeting where we come and learn about God and what his will is for us as they were in the wilderness. Like taking a vine that you didn't want anymore out of your garden. That's the imagery that we're, we're observing there. All right? All right, question 10. Well, I know. Well, what, I, hadn't, I hadn't got there yet. Uh, what had the priest failed to do? And I, there's a reason why I said priest. 
But in this section, you'll find it's the prophets. So let's answer that first. What do the prophets do? I really want to get down what the priests do. Look at verse 14. The prophets have seen for thee false and foolish visions. What brings to your memory? False and foolish visions. What were some of them that while Jeremiah is telling the truth, what were they refusing to acknowledge? They wouldn't acknowledge 70 years. We're just going to be back. Even after they got <laughs> captured, we'll be back in two years. Check it out. Come out of here. That didn't happen. Jack and I stayed there. They didn't come back till 70 years. But they also was teaching that you'll never see the sword of Babylon. In the name of God, you'll never see the sword of Babylon. I got it straight from God. And they like to hear that. And we're not going into captivity. Even before, said, well, we'll only be there two years. They still did not acknowledge the very truth of God through his prophet. And there, all the things that were said were indeed vain. Look at Jeremiah. I know our time is to develop this is a little short, but chapter 6 of Jeremiah. I want you to notice with me uh, verse 13 and 14. From the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. From the prophet even to the what? The priest. Now, a prophet go out here and he can speak the word, uh, speak in the name of the Lord. But what should the priest be doing? Teaching the word of the Lord. And they didn't do that. They're, they're as covetous as the others. Preach, teaching what the people want to hear. In verse 14, they healed also the hurt of my people, slightly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. We're not going to be bothered by Chaldeans. Yeah, peace. They're still in their sin, covetous from the priest to the prophet. They indeed had, had gone through that. And uh, therefore, we, we come to verse nine, question nine. What was the unlikely plight of the priest and the prophets in this chapter two? What was the unlikely, unlikely result? Thank you. And then we'll have to close. The youth and the old man lie on the ground of the, of, the, of the streets. My virgins and my young men are fallen by the sword. Thou hast slain them in the day of thy anger. Thou hast slaughtered them and hath not pity. Verse 20 says, O behold, to whom hast thou done this? Shall the women eat their fruit of their children and are dandled in their hands? Shall the priest and the prophet be slain in the sanctuary of the Lord? Forbid that. It will never happen. And we'll see next week, Lord willing, that eating their children happened too, and you would never think that would happen. So what else happened? In the sanctuary, the priest and the prophet were slain. That happened. That's, and, and it, indeed, that would cause the people to have the tears of something that would never happen. My tears flow. I thought that could never happen to us. It did. And we're in the midst of feeling that. So what happened? And during that caused the eyes to fail with tears. That, that's part of it. Any, any comments or questions? And we'll, we'll get into lesson uh, two. I'll have the outlines for you uh, Sunday out there. Anything you'd like to add or a question you might have? All right.